Now we've covered a bit about dimensionality and space-time in our earlier lectures and I wanted to relate that to the H&H &H world here by drawing some maybe exaggerated distinctions between steady and unsteady models. Now when we looked at hydrographs and hiatographs in our earlier lectures, um, whether they're stage or flow hydrographs, they are time series, meaning that the x-axis is time. Um, and any movement along the x-axis from one point to the next would be a delta t, or a dt. Now the y-axis could be anything from rainfall depth, intensity, stage, it could be a number of other parameters. Um, in this case, this hydrograph shows discharge on the y-axis, and that's in terms of volume per time. So time is actually included on both axes. Now this hydrograph here is unsteady, meaning it varies with time, but let's add a steady flow to the same chart. Now this steady flow then is at a single rate. Well, what does that mean in terms of the volumes of water and um, any implications that way? Well, let's have a look first. Um, having been out of school longer than I want to admit, um, I tend to get intimidated by mathematical symbols. Uh, but these two concepts here don't need to be overwhelming to a modeler uh, because they can be tied directly to the real world concepts that we are discussing. Now, x can be anything, um, but in our case, it's time. And the derivative is simply the slope, um, which, again, if this was position, then our derivative would be velocity. And if this was velocity, the derivative would be acceleration. So position becomes velocity, velocity becomes acceleration, and so on. Now, if we had st a stage hydrograph here, um, the derivative would tell us how quickly the water is rising. If your house was two meters above the flood level and it's rising at a rate of one meter per hour while projecting the slope of that curve, that's the derivative that will tell you it's time to get out of there. Um, the integral, on the other hand, is the area under the curve, which we can slice in a number of different ways. And I like this visualization and how we might uh, be bringing some of these things together in terms of a um, you know, the sine curve. Um, it looks like complex math, but you know this is uh, this is what's uh, you know there are some real world applications here that um, hopefully we'll get to the bottom of um, by the end of this lecture. So the area under the curve is an integral, and in our case that represents a volume. So that blue shaded area is a volume of water. So any given box in here represents a specific volume of water. So in our case, um, we've got along the y-axis, it's discharge. So the dq from 400 to 600 is 200 cubic meters per second. Now, as long as we convert time to the same unit, we can multiply length times width for this box. And in our case, seconds cancel out. 200 cubic meters per second times 3,600 seconds is 720,000 cubic meters. So inside this blue box is a volume of 720 megaliters. Now, how do steady flows relate and how do they plot along these charts? Well, a steady flow doesn't change ever. I mean, forever and ever. It essentially stays the same at that rate for an infinite amount of time. So what would the area, the integral, under a steady flow curve be? Well, it doesn't matter whether you're running a low flow or a medium flow or a high flow through your model the volume under the curve will be infinite. So you could say, well, this infinity is bigger than that infinity, but it doesn't really matter. Each of these flows, if diverted into a storage area, even if it's the tiniest trickle down here, it will fill any available storage area volume, um, no matter how large that might be. So to demonstrate this concept with a really exaggerated example, let's have a look at an application using a HECRAS model. Now, we'll go back to New York for this one and zoom back in on our uh, terrace pool at the Empire State Building. Now, in this uh, terrace pool here, uh, if I zoom back in on this one, um, you know, we, we could have done a much larger example, but in this case, I'm going to just, uh, again, exaggerate this a little bit, and we're going to change the elevations of this pool. So if I zoom in on this one um, and go back to our terrace, um, this terrace uh, at this point only had 20 centimeters of water in it, right? We were running one cubic meter per second at the upstream end, uh, same amount coming out at the downstream end as a steady flow or a pseudo steady flow that we've run through 2D. Well, now um, you can see the flow directions there. Uh, it's flowing down, uh, well, to the north, I guess, um, uh, along this terrace. What I'm gonna do now is let's make a mistake in the terrain. 
So I'm going to clone the terrain. The terrain, we initially started with it at 100 meters, and then we propped it up, tilted it a little bit, so it's at a bit of a gradient. Um, what I'm going to do now is I've cloned this terrain, and I'm going to modify it. And I'm going to put some more control points on it, um, just like we did before to rotate it. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to put some artificial t control points that are wrong. So right at the midpoint, um, let me just turn this on to see where the midpoint was. Um, sometimes you'll get um, these no data values that come out as actual elevations. Um, some software has it as negative 999, some it's negative 9999, sometimes it's a million or something or more uh, below sea level, just so you know that it's no data. Well, sometimes some of the software will interpret those as data. So let's assume that we made that mistake in our software. Um, as it was cutting cross sections, it found a no data value and it accidentally interpreted that as data. And we'll use this as our example to show the differences between steady and unsteady flow. So now I've got this wedge here basically, and I've dug a hole and um, let me save that modification and we'll have a look at um, what this uh, what this looks like. Um, maybe if I go from the upstream end, you can see that readout there. See, I'm going down to negative 9999 and then coming back up um, to real world elevations. So there is a slope to this thing. Um, that gradient um, that we see, um, you know, we, we might be able to plot that out. It, not sure it really means anything, um, but uh, again, if this was a, a mistake, um, you know, this might just be a really, really deep hole. Uh, so if I go ahead and take this one here, um, let me go into the geometry, and let's actually um, have a look at this one. Uh, I'll give it a new name so I don't save over the top of what I had before. I'm going to call this no data. So um, this is my, my no data mistake. Um, this is the one that uh, took that value um, and artificially applied it. Uh, let me just call this one again as the plan, no data, so that I don't overwrite my previous plan. So with that one in place, I'm going to save this one and um, open up a new plan. And we'll do the same thing. Um, well, we can do both. Uh, we'll, we'll compare this uh, between both 1D and 2D and see what the difference is. So before we do that, um, let me just go back to the steady flow. Um, unsteady actually is not going to run on this one. Um, it's not going to run back uphill again. So let me go to the steady flow run, and we'll have a look at what that looks like um, when we apply that same terrain to it. Now, I could just cut it. Uh, cut the 1D sections again, recut them across the terrain. But in this case, let me just save as here. I'm going to call the 1D a, a no data value here. Um, that's my 1D steady flow run. I'll give this a new name as well so I don't write over the top of what I had before. And we'll go with um, 1D terrace 1 cubic meter a second. We'll keep the same flow in there and we'll call it the no data run. Um, and, and just to distinguish from the other one, uh, make sure we know that this is not unsteady. We're going to save this as the steady flow run. Now, what uh, what happens when I save this one? Um, let me go back in, and we'll have a look here in in the in the mapper, um, and go back to our one uh, D terrace here. Let's see. Now, what I'll need to do here is. Um, change the terrain associations. Um, just make sure that both the 1D and the 2D no data values um, or no data geometries are going to be attached to the correct terrain elevation, which has this new wedge, this no data wedge uh, built into it. So I've got no data there. And if I go ahead and have a look at the uh, individual values, I should be able to see, um, well, here's my individual grids. And uh, if I, um, have a look down there at uh, the 2D as well and the 1D um, and compare them. Now I've got uh, got them all lining up. So right in the middle of this thing is a deep hole. Uh, that could be uh, artificial excavation. Um, this could be a mistake, but uh, what we'll have a look at here, if I go ahead and scroll down, you can see that my elevations now go down to you know 10,000 meters below sea level. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, on the terrain, um, now I'm going to make my cross sections match, which you can see down there where the terrain is, and I'm going to lower that one at chainage 20, at station 20, to be uh, 10,000 meters below sea level. So um, again, this is going to give us a storage area that is very, very large, and that storage area then is going to, um, you know, take some of the water from our steady flow run and um, 
and basically store it. And let's see how long it takes uh, to do that. So there's my uh, terrain surface, the real surface, and the mistake surface, <laughs> which is down there uh, is as a wedge. So that's uh, that's both 1D and 2D, so that we can compare those. Now, is it, could this ever happen? <laughs> let's just pull in this uh, webinar we did. There's a hole that is over 10,000 meters deep, okay? Real, it's a real hole that's 10,000 meters deep. Those other ones, those other visualizations uh, don't show um, uh, something real, but um, you know, there are times when you could get 10,000 meters below sea level and have to model that. So, you know, even though it's a very exaggerated situation here, um, you know, there are situations where you do get uh, well below sea level. So let's go in here and uh, try running this. And when we run the 1D, have a look at this, what happened in less than a second, that one cubic meter per second that we just ran instantaneously has now, if I look at this wedge, filled our hole. Well, how much volume just went into that? Our one cubic meter a second, which ran as steady flow, so without a time axis basically, um, has gone in and filled in some volume. Well, how much volume is that? In Hecraz, it's actually very easy to determine um, what your stage volume relationship is, um, how much volume that could store. I'm going to draw a storage area here. This is a 1D storage area. I'm not going to use this for um, my model, but I'll use this to delineate a stage volume curve. Now, if, I've, if it does its math right, we should be able to figure that out very quickly. Um, I'm going to call this one here... Um, for my storage area, this is basically my terrace, um, or it's my no data, I'll call it, just call it no data. And um, the storage area, now I can interrogate it. Let me just click on this one, and we'll develop it from the terrain that I've already assigned here, that wedge. And if I call this, um, well, I need a 100 meter um, uh, maximum elevation, you can actually see the stage volume come up here. And what does it come down to? 2,000 thousand cubic meters, so two gigaliters basically. Does that make sense? Well, 40 by, uh, we've got 10 meters by 40, that's 400 times uh, 10,000 meters deep, would be 4 million, and it's a triangular prism. So yeah, 2 million cubic meters of water. Well, how long, <laughs> as 2 million seconds, how long would that take? Well, let's try and run this through then um, in 2D. So if I take my 2D, um, no data, model run. Um, how long, well, what's going to happen here? If I just leave it as it is and try and run it, how long is this going to take to run? I'm piling one cubic meter a second into this hole, and how long is this going to go? Well, when I run this thing through, it looks like, you know, it's going to take maybe about, uh, yeah, 10, 10 seconds here, um, but I've got a massive error. Think about what we've talked about in terms of 1D, 2D, and 3D, and what the limitations are when this thing is dropping basically down a waterfall. Now I'll change this then back. Well, okay, we can leave this, I think, as uh, the full momentum, but let's let's see what it would do if it picked its own uh, time step. What would the time step need to be if your water is in free fall? Think about your current number that way. And does it even matter if it's going vertically, if we can't measure, um, you know, if we're not really reflecting its horizontal movement very accurately with this deep hole? Well, uh, now I'm running at a much finer time step. I'm just gonna take a little longer to run. Let me just pause it here for a minute and run it faster than it should. And I'll come back into it when it's done. Get closer. And here we are. So this one, uh, yeah, it took a, bit, a minute to run, but I still have a 100% mass balance error. Why? Because we have way exceeded the slopes that we could possibly realistically model in software like this. Um, so how did we do on that? Well, let's have a look here and try and turn on our um, our results. Now let's look at this one in the terms of the depth. Now realistically we haven't had enough time for it to fill up much uh, in two hours. We've got what 7200 seconds so we've got 7200 cubic meters um, that have been added to this. Um, so I don't see anything there on the profile plot um, if I go along there. Um, so we're going to need to run this for a bit longer. Um, if I'm bringing one cubic meter a second in and I wanted to fill up that two million, um, well, how many was two million seconds? I think that's a little over a month, I think. Um, and so we'll run it for the whole month of January here and see how long that takes. Um, I might not uh, just sit here and wait for this thing to run. Um, let me just pause. And there's the answer. So it's, uh, thir you know, it didn't, didn't take too long to run, actually, 30 seconds. That's not too bad. Um, and that runs a month's worth of flow. Well, where did we get to in a month's worth of flow? Let's have a look then and go back to our depths and see 
what happened at the end of our month. If I go to the max, well, look, I've got water in the bottom of this wedge. Um, and let's just plot the profile and show where it is sitting. Well, there in the bottom of the wedge, I've got some water stored. Not the correct volume of water, again, because this has not been uh, not a stable model by any means. Um, what I'm after here is um, actually the differences between the uh, simulation times and the computation times, the computer time, and just to show um, how steady flow can do this instantly, no matter how big of a trickle it is. So let's take these steady flows then. Um, go back and save that plan and what what if this uh, this flow was just a um, you know bit of a trickle say you're uh, tossing in not one cubic meter per second but um, one liter per second so let me just um, take my steady flow data there one liter per second would be 0.001 um, cubic meters per second well how long would that take to fill if I save that one um, again I'm going to save my plan as one liter per second LPS um, same slope the slope doesn't necessarily apply here because uh, that's really your outlet where we're coming back up over this um, uh, this vertical wedge um, but let's just see how long that would take to run if I go into a um, steady flow run and this is going to be again with my no data values and we'll call this one one liter per second um, as a steady flow run well, now it's going to have to run a whole lot longer to fill in that gap, right? So if I go ahead and hit um, save this one, and then we'll hit compute on this. And let's see, how long does the steady flow take to run to fill that gap? Boom, <laughs> done in less than a second. Okay, so that's, uh, it, it did it again. It, it filled all that water up with one liter per second. So every three seconds, you're tossing in one milk jug into this uh, uh, into this hole, how long would it take you? Well, I think I've computed this out to be about 60, 60 years or so that that would take. Um, well, what if we went on um, and did it one cubic centimeter per second? <laughs> um, and uh, let, that would be even less. So that's like um, a little, my little syringe that I use in the class here. If I sprayed that little syringe once per second, uh, one cubic centimeter per second, um, how long would that take? Um, to, to run. So in reality, this is going to take you an awful long time. Um, this is going to be you know, hundreds of years, I would guess, uh, to fill this up. You might be uh, looking at, uh, you know, toward, toward the, the Earth starting to move toward the sun by the time this actually happens, um, if you were filling in one cubic centimeter uh, every second to try and get to two million. So um, things are, are, you know, it would take a long, long time. Um, and, but basically when we hit run, <laughs> on this one on the steady flow run it still computed that in a split second okay and that's that's the point that i wanted to get to with this is the differences uh in our steady flow and our unsteady flow run so let's try and do the same thing then in 2d i won't take it down to the cubic centimeter per second but let's do a liter per second so if i go ahead and save this plan as one liter per second and that's going to be my unsteady uh unsteady run one liter per second and so if I take that one and paste it through and run it this way uh, we'll go ahead and see how long that takes to run now my simulation time here I'm gonna need to have values going all the way down um, in this case I'm going to well I've got it now for three months um, I'm gonna need to run it at least for 60 years um, to see uh, how long this is gonna go and so look at that one there I've I've gotten out to tw the year 2114. Um, if I go ahead and take this out a little bit farther, let's go to um, one day. Is that going to be far enough? <laughs> that takes me out to, uh, that only added a little bit more five years there. Um, let me go to 10,000. And we'll go ahead and take this out to weekly, uh, weekly steps here. That way it gets me up um, several hundred years in the future. And that should at least allow one cubic meter per second to fill up that, um, to fill up that uh, artificial hole that we've got. So if I save this and um, run this through, uh, let's see how long this is going to take to run. Now, uh, I'm just counting one, two, three. So each day is about a second. So this would take a well, boy, does it take a long time to run. So I'm not going to wait the six hours that this, this will take to run. I'm just going to kill this thing here. But again, keep in mind, in steady flow mode, this ran instantly. Okay, 
taking exactly the same configuration and trying to put it in unsteady in um, uh, in our 2D domain. I should have changed that name there to 2D. Uh, I'll do that. So make that correction here shortly. But uh, yeah, again, I, w one thing I could do to just instantly do the same thing is to give an initial elevation. And so now when I do that, um, I could actually shorten this time way up and only run it for maybe a few hours or a few days. Um, I'll just take this and run it for maybe one month and we'll see how long that takes. That, um, again, it's going to run much quicker. Um, every day is going to run in a second or so. Let me fast forward this here. Off we go. And again, bogus run, 300% volume accounting error, mass balance error, it ran in uh, you know, 30 seconds or so. And so that, um, let's see what happens then when we go back into RAS Mapper and check our results. Well, when we go in and try to pull out our 2D unsteady results um, and plot out that water surface, well, there it is. See that? I filled in the whole thing because I gave it an initial volume. Okay, I gave it that initial ele um, uh, elevation to start with. So that's, um, again, hopefully illustrates some of the differences uh, between steady flow and unsteady. This does seem like a bit of an absurd, absurd example. You can see the depths there went from 10,000 down to zero. Um, let me zoom back out on this one here. And, you know, th this is not something that's, uh, you know, it seems absurd to take a little syringe and spray something in there um, every, uh, every second. But when we start getting into groundwater flows and aquifers and m recoveries from mine pits and that sort of a thing, um, let's go back to our hydrographs here and have a look at what that means. I mean, there are things that take hundreds of years to recover, um, and they recover a trickle at a time uh, in some cases. So there, there are models where we might need to run this. In our case, I was just showing this for demonstration purposes. Um, the With a steady flow, no matter how small, it's got the infinite capacity to instantly fill any sink. And so, again, that seemed maybe a bit unrealistic, but here's a profile view from a real HECRAS model that I was running. Um, this might look like an error in the terrain, uh, but it's actually to scale. It's highly vertically exaggerated, um, but it is to scale. And um, if I turn it on its side here and look at the cross-section view instead of the long section uh, longitudinal uh, profile, you can see a little more what's going on here. Um, still a bit vertically exaggerated. Let me just take this then and change that vertical exaggeration a little bit. It's stretched out a bit more here. And you can see there's a river running into the page up in here. There's a pretty sizable levee next to it. But it all looks pretty tiny compared to this uh, mining pit that we're modeling. And the instant, in a steady flow model, um, the instant a drop of water gets over the top of that levee, the entire pit will immediately fill up. And in reality, of course, any storm is going to have a limited volume. And so then you'd have to check your runoff volumes and base flow to determine the effect on the downstream flows. Now here, um, you know, this, this actually happens, and this is actually something that we need to, uh, to model. Um, but um, even if there never was enough water to get the stream flowing again, you know, once it runs into this pit, the steady flow model is going to fill it in. And another point of warning I wanted to mention uh, in closing is that if the flows are subcritical um, and you're running a 1D steady flow step back water model, it will have already computed the downstream water surface elevations before moving or stepping up to the next section upstream. So the model results can be deceiving if they're not interpreted correctly, because in this case, if you had some farms downstream, say, um, a modeler could look at it and say, well, look, I ran this model and it had a thousand cross sections and I had sub centimeter vertical accuracy. And look, the model showed no downstream impacts on your farm from this big old pit in the ground upstream. Well, in this case, you better go unsteady because in this case, obviously, the storage is significant. So I hope that helps with a bit of visualization to demonstrate the differences between steady and unsteady models and why a modeler needs to be aware of storage factors when selecting between them and what considerations the simulation time might uh, add to your decision making process for selecting an approach. So let's bring our other presenters back on for a panel discussion and we'll hit the Q&A questions that have come up uh, that, have, that have come in during the session before we move on to our next topic.